Using this online resource, I was able to find the characters with spaces that would automatically count all the words, all the characters and spaces within every book put together, pushed together in one continuous document in this line that you see over here in this window in the green. Um, at this point, characters with spaces is 13,342,069. Characters without space is 10,821,810. Total words at this point with the book series is 2,000,000. 549,295. Total uh, white space is 
a presentation of South Carolina ETV. Major funding for this program was provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional funding was provided by the Hugh Call Foundation, EBSCO Industries Incorporated, and additional funding from the following. was a year of uncommon brilliance. Stravinsky's ballet, The Rite of Spring, started a riot. Sigmund Freud published Totem and Taboo. Charlie Chaplin made his first movie. And in Paris, Marcel Proust brought out the first part of Remembrance of Things Past. Proust's monumental novel shook the literary world when it appeared. Now a classic translated into dozens of languages, it still astonishes readers as the work of a daring, uncompromising genius. Proust has been the man that hung the moon for me. He's, uh, he's uh, uh, with Shakespeare in my mind in the sense of having such a various talent. Uh, whenever you read Proust, for the rest of your life, he is part of you, the way Shakespeare is part of you. Uh, I, I don't want to exaggerate, uh, but I truly feel that he is the great writer of the 20th century. He writes like an angel. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a marvelous uh, eloquence. And he's very funny. I mean, so there are marvelous jokes in Proust, which one goes on retelling to one's friends as well. Like coffee, like whiskey. Uh, he's a special blend, and it's, it's a blend of these very fine impressions. He calls them impressions. It has something to do with impressionist painting, but it's much more than that. The most vital sensations that make up a person's life and give him or her the, the conviction of being alive. The question just of what is it to be alive as a human being. For a long time, I used to go to bed early. Then, when I awoke in the middle of the night, the memory would come like a rope let down from heaven and draw me up out of the abyss. And I would recall our life in the old days, remembering again all the places and people I had known, what I had actually seen of them, and what others had told me. worked on remembrance of things past for over 14 years, writing more than a million words and conjuring up some 200 characters. His 3,000-page novel encompasses many themes, from the vain snobbery of high society to the stirrings of memory and the unstoppable nature of time. Yet at its most fundamental, Remembrance is the story of one character, the narrator, a man very much like Proust, who sets off on an extraordinary journey to become the artist he'd always longed to be. for his novel, Proust drew on the striking paradoxes in his own personality. A star of the Paris social scene, he befriended anti-Semitic aristocrats, though he was half Jewish. He depicted with rare insight the love between a man and a woman, yet he was homosexual. And though he wasted his youth, as he put it, when he was almost 40, he dedicated himself to writing with an intensity rare in the history of literature. His life was the raw material which he used to write Remembrance of Things Past, making changes that he thought would make the truth more evident. Proust invented nothing, but he altered everything. Everything from his life and from his times goes into the novel in some fashion. In Proust's 
its lifetime from the gilded 1800s through the Belle Epoque and the Great War, change was swift and deep. The world of ideas and everyday life would never be the same. And Proust, by revolutionizing the novel, was himself a force of lasting change. Marcel Valentin Louis Eugène Georges Proust was born in Paris into a middle class family in July of 1871. Frail, high strung, maddeningly precocious, he got along well with his little brother Robert, though he taunted him with nicknames like His Majesty. Marcel had the last word in their friendly rivalry. In his novel, he made the narrator an only child. Madame Jeanne Proust came from a Jewish family of Parisian bankers. Unusually well educated, she spoke several languages and in conversation effortlessly quoted from the likes of Victor Hugo and Molière. Marcel's father was Adrien Proust, a brusque, hard-working physician. The son of Catholic shopkeepers, Dr. Proust wrote numerous medical textbooks and became well known for leading France's fight against deadly epidemics of cholera. Sometimes the family left the city for holidays in Dr. Proust's hometown of Illiers, west of Paris. These boyhood trips would later inspire Proust to set the opening scenes of his novel in that now legendary place he called Combray. In the garden of Combray, I discovered the pleasure of being comfortably seated, of sniffing the fragrance of the air. And when the hour chimed from the steeple of Saint Hilaire, of seeing what was left of the afternoon fall drop by drop. And as each hour struck, it would seem to me that only a few moments had passed since the hour before. The fascination of my book, a magic as potent as the deepest slumber, had deceived my enchanted ears. represents really the Eden which Proust has started with. It's his genesis, uh, and basically I call it the, the age of faith of Marcel, the narrator. We lose our belief as we grow older, but at the ages, say, from, from four to six or eight, we still believe in the people that are around us. We believe that things are what they appear to be, and we haven't lost our faith to the worm of doubt. Proust's life changed forever at the age of nine when he had his first asthma attack on a Paris sidewalk. He nearly died. The disease would stay with him, greatly restricting his activities. But by having to stand apart from other children, he learned early to be an especially keen observer. Because of his asthma, Marcel now vacationed on the Normandy coast, where the fresh sea air, Dr. Proust said, would do the boy good. In resorts like Etretat and Cabourg, Marcel discovered a new world of straight-laced Parisians let loose on vacation. He would spend hours with his mother, taking in the sights and gathering impressions like so many shells. As Proust described it in remembrance, these were moments of an uncanny sort of oneness. I knew when I was with her that however great the misery that there was in me, it would be received by her with a pity still more vast, that everything that was mine, my cares, my wishes, would be buttressed in her, that my thoughts were continued and extended in her without undergoing the slightest deflection since they passed from my mind into hers without any change of atmosphere or of personality.
His illness uh, drew his mother closer to him, and I'm sure he used it uh, for that purpose. Uh, they were very close. Uh, she was the intellectual of the family, the one interested in painting and music and literature. And uh, her, her influence on Proust is uh, probably the greatest influence in his life, surely. At school, Proust excelled in philosophy and won prizes for his compositions, which already showed signs of his singular style. One notable essay that startled his teachers contained long, elaborate sentences that filled whole pages. After graduating from the Lycée, Proust joined the army, fulfilling his military obligation. It was 1889 and war was nowhere in sight. Asma kept his marching to a minimum, and because his coughing fit shook the barracks, he moved into a private apartment, complete with a servant who polished his boots. The dashing cadet grew to like army life, and even tried to re-enlist, but he was turned down. Out of his class of 64, Trooper Proust finished 63rd. The time had come for him to choose a career. Dr. Proust, now a public health authority who often dined with the president of France, worried about Marcel's future. Knowing his son was clever with words, he urged him to become a diplomat or a lawyer. Marcel went on to earn university degrees in both philosophy and law, but his mind was elsewhere, and he fell in with the sporting set. Not that he liked competition. He was on the sidelines, entertaining his new society friends at what he called the court of love. Dr. Proust was not amused. He cited the sterling example of Marcel's younger brother, Robert, who was doing so well in medical school and suggested Marcel join a law firm. My dearest Papa, I have kept hoping that I would finally be able to go on with the literary and philosophical studies for which I believe myself fit. As for a law office, I assure you I wouldn't stick it out for three days. I still believe that anything I do outside of literature and philosophy will be just so much lost time. After many family arguments, Marcel convinced his father to finance one more year of studies. But Marcel was living way beyond his means, always going to parties or entertaining at home. He also began writing stories about his new milieu, and even penned a society column which he signed, The Man About Town. set his sights on the highest rung of the social ladder, the drawing rooms of the city's most prominent aristocrats. There he pandered to dukes and duchesses, trying to win introductions, and he charmed hostesses with poems and flattery. Sparing no expense, he sent them huge bouquets of flowers. His social climb was legendary. Gaining someone's favor with outlandish compliments was known back then as Proustifying. Marcel Proust était un homme d'un charme ensorcelant, et très vite il a fait fondre toutes mes résistances. Il mangeait d'une buvée, il parlait, il me racontait toutes les histoires de la journée. Il adorait les potins. Tout de même, on parlait beaucoup de lui, n'est-ce pas Non, pas tant parce qu'il avait fait, mais enfin, il y avait. Je ne sais pas, alors, de sa vie, il, avait, il était en vedette, comme on dirait aujourd'hui, tout de même, certainement, au moins dans, une certaine, dans un certain monde. He really entered and explored the world that we would have to designate as the world of snobbery. He saw these as the beautiful people, even the movie stars of his era. And in his novel, everything is transformed. The salon hostesses, the people who gave garden parties provide some of the main characters and provide a great number of the more comic scenes. If the drawing room was the laboratory where Proust studied the aristocracy, it was also the stage where he saw the era's finest artists. 
He would transform them into fictional characters, too. There was actress Sarah Bernhardt, composer Debussy, English writer Oscar Wilde, painter Claude Monet. At one party in his early 20s, Proust met the pianist Reynaldo Hahn. Proust and the young Venezuelan would become intimate companions for several years and would remain close friends for life. Hahn, who was also a gifted composer, encouraged Proust to take himself more seriously as a writer. At 25, poised for literary fame, Proust published a collection of stories in a fancy volume titled Pleasures and Days. He talked the famed author Anatole France into writing the preface and persuaded a society hostess to draw illustrations. To critics, the book seemed an act of sheer vanity. A columnist for Le Journal called Proust one of those pretty little society boys who got himself pregnant on literature and strongly implied that Proust was a homosexual. To protect his family name, Proust challenged the columnist to a duel. The duelist fired in the air and no one was hurt. Although his honor was restored, it would be years before Proust lived down his reputation as a mere society writer. Quand on a fait des portraits de Proust, comme à la part, par exemple, le Méo Théâtre, il en fait un personnage faible et efféminé. C'était absolument pas Proust. Proust avait beaucoup d'autorité, ce que les Anglais appellent poise. En même temps, beaucoup de courage. Vous regardez bien en face, l'air un peu de défi, de d'Artagnan, la tête en arrière. Il était très courageux. En 1898, le écrivain Émile Zola's cry of J'accuse réignited the Dreyfus affair a momentous scandal that divided France. It was a turning point for Proust and would later play a pivotal role in his novel. Alfred Dreyfus was an army captain who had been court-martialed for selling military secrets to the Germans and sentenced to life on Devil's Island. But many intellectuals, including Zola, believed that Dreyfus was a scapegoat, singled out for humiliation because he was a Jew. Anti-Semitism rocked the country, and posters on Paris streets vilified Dreyfus sympathizers. Proust was half Jewish, and he never forgot this. He never tried to... Uh, uh, deny it or leave it behind. Everyone was aware of this, and he also had a sense of the destiny of the, uh, of the country of France as having to be honest with itself about the military and about justice. So that I don't think there was ever, ever any hesitation in Proust's mind about where he stood on the, on the, on the Dreyfus affair. Proust met with other artists and writers in cafes around Paris to draw up a petition protesting the blatant injustice. Eventually, the so-called Petition of the Intellectuals listed some 3,000 names and was published in a leading newspaper. Proust urged his society friends to sign, but was horrified to see where many of them stood. As one hostess asked, What are you doing with your Jews? Are you keeping them on? And many nobles still insisted the army was right. Some joined a staunch anti-Semitic group, the League of the French Fatherland. Even after Dreyfus was pardoned, anti-Semitism, as Proust wrote in his novel, persisted in French society like a stain. Disillusioned, Proust began to shun high society. Now in his late twenties, he was adopting a nocturnal schedule, rising late in the afternoon and working through the night on an autobiographical novel whose hero he called Jean Santeuil. Childhood impressions, quarrels with his father, his outrage over the Dreyfus affair, 
he struggled to put it all in. This time, he revealed his ambition only to a few friends and his mother. <clears throat> Yet Monsieur and Madame Santoy, who had at first encouraged Jean to go out and about in society, were distressed to see Jean no longer working, reading, thinking, and no longer showing any signs of regret or shame. That boy could have done anything he liked, but he will never do anything, said his grandfather. He worked on the novel for four years, writing nearly a thousand pages. But the real story escaped him. Unaware that it contained the seeds of a future masterpiece, he abandoned Jean Santeuil. The failure of Proust's first novel, Jean Santeuil, is, is that he did not know where he stood to tell the story. Uh, by the time he started remembrance of things past, he knew exactly where he stood, who he was, and what tone of voice he was going to use. And Jean Santé, he, he doesn't know that, and nothing, nothing has validity in it because of that lack. I don't mean there aren't good things in it, there are. In November of 1903, while teaching at the medical school, Dr. Proust had a massive stroke. Two days later, he died. The loss, Proust said in a letter, only heightened his sense of failure. Papa was a very sweet and simple man. I tried not to live up to his expectations, for I'm well aware that I was always the dark spot in his life, but to show him my affection. And still there were days when I rebelled against the excessive certainty of his opinions. Other people have some sort of ambition to console them. I have none. At his mother's suggestion, Proust resumed work on an unfinished project, translating into French books by John Ruskin, the visionary English art critic. The poet Kenneth Rexroth once said that when, when a poet isn't writing well, he should turn to translation. This will keep him busy, and he will learn from it. This is basically what, what Proust did. Ruskin is a highly skilled writer. Uh, he's not read much anymore because his views on art are so different from ours, for the most part. But the writing itself is, uh, is wondrous. Uh, and Proust uh, learned a great deal, of course, about it in a very intimate way by translating it. No matter how feeble his English was, he was able to absorb a great deal of what Ruskin had to teach him about the mechanics of writing. The cathedral in Amiens, France, Ruskin said, was like a Bible carved in stone. To translate Ruskin's book on the Gothic structure, he depended on his mother, whose English was excellent. He published the translation in 1904 and wrote a hundred-page preface in which he clarified his own artistic beliefs. Later, in remembrance, he returned to the cathedral, seeing it as a statement about art, not religion. To Proust, the cathedral was the ultimate expression of the power of art to withstand the forces of time. The church was for me an edifice occupying, so to speak, a four-dimensional space. The name of the fourth being time. Extending through the centuries its ancient nave, which bay after bay, chapel after chapel, seemed to stretch across and conquer not merely a few yards of soil, but each successive epoch from which it emerged, triumphant.
Proust translated two of Ruskin's books, a labor of almost six years. The work, he said, aroused his thirst to create something original. As he told a friend at the time, I see hundreds of characters for a novel, a thousand ideas begging me to give them voice. In September of 1905, barely two years after his father's death, Proust's mother, his dearest and most constant friend, and lately his close collaborator, died in Paris after a brief illness. My life has forever lost its only purpose, its only comfort, its only love, its only consolation. I have lost her whose unceasing vigilance brought me in peace and tenderness, the only sweetness of my days. Proust's friends were afraid he might go mad with grief. After the funeral, he spent two months at a sanitarium before feebly making his way to a hotel in Versailles. There he stayed through the fall and winter, rising at dusk, exploring what he called the unknown regions of grief. In five months, he never left the hotel. Am I really at Versailles? I haven't left my room. I haven't seen the palace, the Trianon, or anything. I haven't waked up until nightfall, and I know nothing of the charms of the season or the hour. Am I at Versailles or elsewhere? I know nothing about it. When she was subtracted from his life, uh, it, it was a devastating, uh, knee-buckling blow. Uh, I think the, the notion of the mother is a very strong thing in French life anyhow. And for Proust, it was ten times as strong as any other Frenchman. So her death uh, ha had a double function of freeing him to say things he might not have been able to say for fear of offending her. And yet it also... Uh, <clears throat> gave him uh, this huge grief that seemed to paralyze him. He was no longer be able to write or anything. Uh, and it was only after he recovered from it to the extent that he did that he was able to understand the nature of grief. After a miserable year in Paris, Proust followed his doctor's orders and took a holiday. It was the summer of 1907. Pale and shaken, he was dazzled, he said, by the mere sight of the sun. He drank 17 cups of coffee to steal his nerves and hired a frightening new contraption. Riding in a car, he said, was like being shot from a cannon. He traveled through Normandy, touring villages he'd known as a boy. It was a place that could only remind him of his mother. And yet this journey into the past was somehow renewing. One is cured of suffering only by experiencing it to the full. Perhaps the great sorrow that follows the death of the mother simply breaks the chrysalis and hastens the metamorphosis the appearance of another self we carry within us. At the Grand Hotel in Cabour, where he'd stayed as a child, he revisited what he called the happy years. And he found the strength to write again. Ideas, Proust said, come to us as the successors to grief. I am working on a study of the nobility, an essay on Sainte-Beuve and Flaubert. 
an essay on women, on homosexuality. This will not be easy to publish. A study of stained glass windows and the novel. He was preoccupied by his essay on Saint-Beuve, the leading French literary critic. Proust took issue with the critic's notion that writers should be judged by their moral character and intellect, their outward persona. Proust's thoughts blossomed into a 700-page essay in which he argued that art grew out of a hidden, largely mysterious self. As for intellect, he said, it usually impeded the flow of creativity. There was no better evidence for that than Proust himself a brilliant intellectual who so far had failed as an artist. For the last few years, he'd been working on a novel, but in draft after draft, had come no closer to reaching what he called his heart's core. mixed with the crumbs touched my palate, then a shudder ran through me and I stopped. Intent upon the extraordinary thing that was happening to me. At once the vicissitudes of life had become indifferent to me, its disasters innocuous, its brevity illusory. I had ceased now to feel mediocre, contingent, mortal. Whence could have come to me this all powerful joy. In that moment, all the flowers in our garden and in Monsieur Swan's park, and the water lilies on the Vivan, and the good folk of the village, and the little dwellings, and the parish church, and the whole of Combray and its surroundings, taking shape and solidity, sprang into being, town and gardens alike, from my cup of tea. We've all had at least twinges of memory which are so vivid that they've taken us back to a point in the past and there's a real short circuit, a real identification with that past. But for the most part, we forget about it. It's just like uh, an itch or a, or a sneeze. Proust turned around and said, that is the most important thing that I have felt. And at, at that point, uh, he started writing, uh, using bits that he'd already written, he started writing the book that we now call a remembrance of things past. To accommodate his bizarre working habits, Proust had his apartment remodeled. Having inherited a small fortune from his mother's family, he could afford to live and work as he pleased. Because he was extremely sensitive to noise, he wanted to soundproof his bedroom. And so the walls and even the ceiling were covered with squares of cork, insulating Proust from the outside world. Quand les voisins du dessus engageaient un domestique, il lui disait nous ne vous donnerons de gage que 50 francs par mois, mais il y a au-dessus un monsieur, monsieur Marcel Proust, qui vous en donnera 100 régulièrement si vous voulez bien marcher avec des chaussons parce que le bruit le gêne. Où il avait tellement peur du bruit qu'il payait très cher les ouvriers pour ne pas travailler dans l'appartement d'au-dessus. Alors les gens revenaient stupéfaits parce que rien n'était... Rien n'avait été fait de ce qu'ils avaient commandé aux ouvriers. C'est parce que Marcel les payait très cher pour ne rien faire, pour ne pas travailler au-dessus de sa tête. Eccentric as they seemed, Proust's arrangements were the efforts of a determined, if not desperate, man. He would begin his day at sundown and right through the night. The windows would always be shut and the drapes drawn. His allergies, worse than ever, he had a morbid fear of dust and soot. 
and so even in the chill of winter, the fireplace would seldom be lit. As he wrote to a friend, I am cloistering myself for a long work. Proust's novel was rapidly growing beyond the bounds of a single volume, so he split it into two parts, a truly fateful decision. He finally settled on an overall title, À la recherche du temps perdu, literally, In Search of Lost Time. The English translation was later called Remembrance of Things Past, after a line from Shakespeare. In the fall of 1912, his hopes running high, Proust sent volume one called Swan's Way to prospective publishers. First, he tried the Nouvelle Revue Française, an avant-garde literary group. The Revue's director, the famed writer André Gide, dismissed Proust as a snob and a literary amateur. Later, Gide would say that rejecting Proust's book was the biggest mistake of his life. Fasquel was a firm that took pride in publishing the classics, but not, alas, this one, as their editor wrote. You will not find a reader strong enough to stay with it for more than a quarter of an hour, especially with the nature of the sentences that leak all over the place. An editor at Ollendorf, a publishing firm that handled minor French authors, composed this now infamous reply. My dear fellow, I may be dead from the neck up, but rack my brains as I may, I can't see why a chap should need 30 pages to describe how he turns over in bed before going to sleep. I love his long-windedness. Um, I mean, Henry James is also accused of being long-winded, and I'm afraid um, people uh, may be put off him in that sort of way. But uh, I, I adore a long sentence. I agree that sometimes in Proust, and sometimes even in James, uh, looking for the main verb may be a bit of a task, but I mean, it's a very rewarding, rewarding task. It was the relatively unknown Bernard Grasset who finally published Swan's Way but only because Proust paid the printing costs. As it turns out, Grasset's role in literary history was strictly business. He published the volume without reading it. Swan's Way appeared in 1913. Some immediately recognized it as an astonishingly new kind of novel, and Proust as a brand new voice. Je voyais un homme qui avait inventé son style. Il était seul à pouvoir dire ce qu'il avait à dire, mais pour le dire, il avait inventé son instrument. In Proust's incomparable prose, ordinary moments are magnified and sharpened, as in this now famous look at a simple goodnight kiss. My sole consolation when I went upstairs for the night was that Mama would come up and kiss me after I was in bed. But this good night lasted for so short a time that sometimes when after kissing me she opened the door to go, I longed to call her back and say to her, kiss me just once more. But I knew then that she would at once look displeased for the concession she made to my wretchedness and agitation in coming up to give me this kiss of peace always annoyed my father. And to see her look displeased destroyed all the calm and serenity she had brought me a moment before when she bent her loving face down over my bed and held it out to me like a host for an act of communion so that my lips might drink deeply the sense of her real presence and with it the power to sleep. Swan's Way was selling out, headed for a fourth printing, and the second half of the novel was nearly ready for publication. And yet Proust, his friend said, did not seem to be enjoying his achievement. His former driver, Alfred Agostinelli, was now working as his typist, and Proust was hopelessly in love. He'd even given the young man a room in his Paris apartment. But Agostinelli brought along his common-law wife, Anna, and Proust was plagued by jealousy. In love, Proust said, we cannot choose but badly. 
It was the daring new sport of flying that took Agostinelli away. Anna begged Agostinelli to leave Proust and make his fortune as a pilot. Agostinelli went to the Riviera and enrolled in flight school under an assumed name. Strangely enough, Marcel Swan. Proust pleaded with Agostinelli to come back and even offered him an airplane and a Rolls Royce. In the novel, it is an elusive young woman named Albertine that the narrator pursues. I wished you to have that yacht in which you could go cruising while I, not being well enough to accompany you, would wait for you in port. And on land, I wished you to have a Rolls Royce for your very own. But it would be madness for the sake of a sailing boat and a motor car to meet again and to jeopardize your life's happiness since you have decided that it lies in your living apart from me. One spring day in 1914, Agostinelli headed his plane out to sea and crashed. He was dead at 26. Agostinelli was an extraordinary human being. He was, after my mother and father, the person I have loved the most. Three months later, France was at war. Proust, whose poor health kept him out of the army, followed the action by reading seven newspapers a day and corresponding with men at the front. He heard of loss upon loss, one friend after another dying on the battle lines, what he called those shores of death. the devastation wrought by the German army. The ancient provincial towns, the great cathedrals that had so inspired him. All that mixture of art and still living history that was France is being destroyed. And we have not seen the end of the process yet. Braced for German air raids, Proust remained in the city. And with his valet and cook in the army, he hired a resourceful countrywoman named Celeste Albert to be his housekeeper. She would devote herself to him, and he would confide nearly everything in her. No one could exaggerate Celeste's role in Proust's life and in the writing of Remembrance of Things Past. Uh, she performed so many offices, so many services for him that he apparently couldn't have gotten along without. Uh, of course, you could say like Voltaire, if it hadn't been in his Celeste, he would have invented one, but uh, still, she did what she did. She served him magnificently well. And it must not have been easy. Quelquefois, il prenait son travail dans l'après-midi, ce qui était rare. Mais tout ce qui était le départ pour commencer de travailler, c'était surtout une grosse question qui jouait, c'était sa santé. Comme il était, il était un grand malade, car il avait des crises d'asthme terribles. Et quand il étouffait, il ne pouvait pas se livrer au travail et il ne prenait rien. Il ne prenait que du café au lait. With the war delaying the publication of the second half of his novel, Proust made a radical change of plans. Keeping the original ending, he greatly expanded the story in the middle. He now envisioned a novel of unprecedented scope, a cathedral carved in words. Thus, the ravages of the Great War and the narrator's vain pursuit of Albertine would fill whole new volumes of remembrance. The novel would become as dark as the blacked out city. Some nights, Proust visited a nearby hotel 
a male brothel to which he apparently donated some of his family's furniture. Taking note of its fierce taboos, Proust explored this forbidden world much as he had once explored the nature of grief by letting it overwhelm him. Il ne faut pas oublier qu'il a étudié sur lui-même les plaies de ses personnages. Une de ses plaies, je n'en parlerai pas, mais vous savez à quoi je fais allusion. Et on ne peut pas être allé plus loin qu'il ne l'a fait dans cet ordre. A homosexual belongs to that race of beings upon which a curse is laid, and which must live in falsehood and perjury. Because it knows that its desire, that which constitutes life's dearest pleasure, is held to be punishable, shameful, an inadmissible thing. Sons without a mother, to whom they are obliged to lie all her life long, even in the hour when they close her dying eyes. November 1918. Paris celebrates the end of the war. A miraculous and vertiginous peace, Proust said. The city returned to life. To Proust, a very different life. The brassy riffs of the jazz age were a far cry from the elegant strains of the Belle Epoque. Proust bemoaned the universal fatuousness that the war had left in its wake. And he worried that this restless public wouldn't care about the long, meditative story he'd begun in Swan's Way five years before. In 1919, the second volume of Remembrance was published, known in English as Within a Budding Grove. In this installment, the narrator, now an adolescent, visits a seaside resort called Balbec, where he feels the delights of first love. Left by myself, I was simply hanging about in front of the Grand Hotel when I saw five or six girls as different in appearance and manner from all the people one was accustomed to see at Balbec as would have been a flock of gulls arriving from God knows where, performing with measured tread upon the sands, the dawdlers flapping their wings to keep up with the rest. Within a budding grove won the Goncourt Prize, France's highest literary honor. Practically every French newspaper trumpeted the award. Reporters and photographers rushed to interview the 48-year-old author. But Celeste allowed few visitors Overwhelmed by the task of organizing Proust's manuscripts, she was attaching his endless corrections and additions, many of them scribbled on scraps of paper. Five volumes remained to be published, and Proust was far from certain he could fulfill his grand design. His health was failing, and there were days when asthma kept him from working at all. Sustaining himself on pure caffeine and adrenaline, he would blacken the margins of his proof sheets, adding details that enriched his story but further delayed publication. 1920, the third installment, the Guermantes Way, with its artful send-up of snobbery. Very well, give me one good reason why you can't come to Italy, the Duchess said to Swan. But, my dear lady, it's because I shall then have been dead for several months, according to my doctors. What's that you say? cried the Duchess, placed for the first time in her life between two duties as incompatible as going out to dinner and showing compassion for a man who was about to die. Nineteen twenty two, Sodom et Gomorrah, known in English as Cities of the Plain. They felt that to be seen would add perversity to their pleasure and chose to flaunt their dangerous embraces before the eyes of all the world. 
One evening, in a corner of the big ballroom on a sofa, they made no more attempt to conceal what they were doing than if they had been in bed. que certainement la mort le poursuivait et qu'il voudrait finir son œuvre et qu'il serait très désolé d'avoir travaillé tant et de laisser tout inachevé et un soir un matin quand je suis arrivée il était comme un enfant à qui il aurait trouvé le plus beau jouet du monde et le bonheur le plus parfait il me dit oh chère Céleste j'ai une grande nouvelle à vous apprendre et je lui ai dit quoi Qu'est-ce qui a donc passé de tellement...